Hi, I'm Joe Landry, and this is a presentation about the history of Franklin, decade by decade. In this video, we'll look back at the years between 1910 and 1919, and we'll explore the events that happened during that time period. The sources of information that will be discussed in this presentation were taken from such places as the Franklin Register, which was the town's first newspaper, and the Franklin Sentinel, which replaced it. The pictures were taken from the Stanley Chilson collection and the Sanborn fire insurance maps, as well as my own personal pictures and postcards. In addition, I would like to give a special word of thanks to Rebecca Finnegan and the staff at the Franklin Historical Museum for their assistance. The Franklin Historical Museum's website is shown here, where you will find links to Facebook and Instagram. The YMCA Building In February of 1910, Harry Haywood offered a portion of his land on Main Street between Emmons Street and Dean Avenue to the town for the YMCA building. This land was previously owned by Charles J. McKenzie, as seen in this 1888 drawing of Franklin. There was a garage and a shed on the rear of the property, which was considered suitable for such a building by the building committee. On February 11, 1910, a large clock was hung on the Ray Block over the entrance to Chilson's Market to keep citizens up to date on the progress of the fundraising campaign. This clock had been used in Newton, Lawrence, and Wakefield for the same purpose. The goal was to raise $25,000 by February 21st, which was only a few weeks later. In order to fund the cost of this building, a group of 100 prominent business and professional men were organized into 10 teams of 10 men each, and the teams would compete against each other to see which one could generate the most money. Charles A. R. Ray was appointed chairman of this project. On February 22, 1910, only 10 days after the fundraising drive began, an announcement appeared in the Franklin Sentinel which stated that a magnificent victory had been achieved. Over $30,000 had been pledged for the building fund, and this exceeded their goal of $25,000 by a large margin. On the last night of the fundraising campaign, the music hall on the second floor of the Metcalf block was packed to the doors with people who had helped to make the campaign a success. In September of 1910, the Board of Directors of the YMCA awarded the contract for constructing the YMCA building to J. A. Monroe of North Attleboro, whose bid was $1,200 less than the lowest bidder. Construction began soon after that. The large part of the building on the left side was on Emmons Street, and this was where the gymnasium was located. The smaller part of the building on the right side was on Dean Avenue, and this was the McKenzie Garage. The two structures were connected in the middle by new construction. In November of 1911, the building was dedicated. In 1939, the YMCA was disbanded and the Masons took the building over for their own use. It became known as Excelsior Lodge. The Masons continued to own it until the early 2000s when it was destroyed by fire. The Sentinel Building on East Central Street in June of 1911, the Morse Estate began construction on a two-story building on East Central Street, opposite the Opera House. It is 35 feet by 60 feet. In September of 1914, a 30-foot by 25-foot addition was added to the rear of the building to give the Sherman Laundry more room. In later years, the Franklin Sentinel moved from Depot Street to this location. In this 1962 picture, Rizzoli's Pharmacy and the Sentinel Press can be seen located in this building, which is still standing today. Clark Cutler McDermott Company In July of 1911, Walter A. Clark, William Cutler, and Thomas S. McDermott formed a new company on West Central Street at the corner of Fisher Street. It would be named Clark Cutler McDermott Company, and they would produce horse blankets. William Cutler was the president, Thomas McDermott was the vice president, and Walter Clark was the treasurer. The Crescent House 
In October of 1911, the Crescent House on Main Street was sold at a mortgagee sale. The selling price was $11,400 and was purchased by Austin B. Chilson. It was demolished in the 1930s. The building that stands there today is owned by Verizon. A. Simon & Son Company In December of 1911, an advertisement appeared in the Franklin Sentinel to announce a new store in Franklin. It was known as A. Simon & Son and was first located at 44 Main Street in the Chilson Block. The store moved to the Music Hall in the Metcalf Block in 1912 when the Chilson Block was redesigned. In December of 1914, the store moved across from the Metcalf Block to a new building that had been constructed for them on the Russicu property. In the early 1930s, the store moved to East Central Street, where they are still located to this day. The Theron Metcalf School In March of 1912, a recommendation was made to the voters of Franklin for a new brick schoolhouse that would be built on Winter Street. There was a congestion in other parts of the town, and it was hoped that a rearrangement of the pupils in the immediate congestion may be taken care of, and that pupils in all parts of the town would receive the instruction that they were entitled to. In September of 1913, the new Theron Metcalf School was dedicated. In June of 1919, voters turned out at a town meeting to discuss plans to add two new wings to the school and two rooms in the basement to be used for manual training and domestic science. The plan also called for the installation of a heating plant outside the building. Today, this building is used for housing for the elderly. The Summers Soap Factory In April of 1912, the former Summers Soap Factory on Dean Avenue was torn down by Harry Bulliken, the new owner of the factory, to make room for a modern double tenement house. The post office in the Chilson Block. This is the Chilson Block, which was constructed in 1870 by James O. Chilson. It was located on Main Street, directly across from today's post office. In 1913, the decision was made to relocate the post office to this building from its previous location in the first Ray Block. Plans were drawn up that would radically change the design of this building. A third floor would be added to the building, and the outside of the building would be covered with the same type of stucco cement that was used on the newly constructed YMCA building. However, just days before the reconstruction of the building was to begin, Mr. Chilson changed his mind and decided to demolish the building and construct a three-story brick building in its place. The Renumbering of Downtown Streets in January of 1911, Dean L. Chilson, a local civil engineer, created a drawing that was used to renumber the houses in the center of town. This is the title block from that drawing. This is a portion of the drawing that Dean Chilson created. The red numbers that appear on the drawing represent the numbers that were assigned to each house or business. The red lines indicate intervals of 25 feet, except for the ones on Main Street between the Town Bridge and Emmons Street. Those were in 20-foot intervals instead of 25. The same was true between the Town Bridge and Summer Street. Those increments were also in 20-foot increments. Even numbers were on one side of the street and odd numbers were on the other side of the street. In July of 1912, Ernest Metcalf was appointed by the selectmen to renumber the streets in accordance with this drawing. The Charles H. Lawrence Bowling Alley In January of 1913, Charles H. Lawrence contracted with the Franklin Construction Company to build a bowling alley in the rear of the new post office on land that belonged to James O. Chilson. Two months later, the bowling alley and the pool room were open for business. In October of 1915, James C. Chilson purchased the bowling alley from Mr. Lawrence. 
the Speer property. In June of 1913, Joseph Cataldo purchased the Speer property from Annie E. Speer. This property, as highlighted in red, was next to his present store, and the tenants were a barber shop and a fruit dealer. In 1923, he would demolish these buildings and would erect the A.J. Cataldo building on that site. Alumni Hall at Dean Academy In July of 1913, Deed Academy awarded a contract to local contractors to build a new building between the gymnasium and Dean Hall. This building would have a swimming pool, recreation rooms, and a dormitory for 18 boys, and a teacher's suite. It would be named Alumni Hall. Harry Bullikin's Five and Dime Store. In August of 1913, Harry Bullikin would open a five and dime store in the Morse Opera House block, formerly occupied by John W. Stober. In March of 1915, the Franklin Home Cash Grocery Company, with Harry Bullikin as the manager, would open in the same store that was currently occupied by Mr. Bullikin's five and dime store. The Keefe Funeral Home. In September of 1913, Thomas F. Keefe became a student at the New England School of Anatomy and Sanitary Science in Boston. In March of 1915, the undertaking business of Keefe and McGinn Funeral Home was taken over by Thomas F. Keefe, and the name was changed to Keefe's Funeral Home. In July of 1918, Mr. Keefe purchased the land and the dwelling of Mrs. A. J. Riley at 33 Cottage Street and would conduct business at that location. Today, this funeral home is the Charles F. O'Terry and Son Funeral Home. W. K. Gilmore and Sons Incorporated. In January of 1914, this notice appeared in the Franklin Sentinel, which announced that W. K. Gilmore and Sons had purchased the grain and coal business of James F. Ray. The Main Gate at Dean Academy. In May of 1914, the ornamental Main Gate at Dean Academy was constructed. This gate was the gift of the classes of 1913 and 1914. The George W. Green Ice Harvesting Business. In September of 1915, George W. Green began construction on a new ice house next to Spring Pond on Washington Street. It was 80 feet long by 42 feet wide and 25 feet high. It was completed in December and had the capacity of storing 2,000 tons of ice. By January of 1922, George Green had a force of 30 men and a big circular saw that was able to cut 1,000 tons of ice per day. It was propelled by a gasoline engine and could cut ice that was 12 inches thick. Police Signals Downtown This notice appeared in the January 1st, 1915 Franklin Sentinel which announced a new police signaling system in downtown Franklin. A red light was installed on the Ray Block, and another red light was installed on the Morse Opera House. The operator would turn on the lights if she was notified of an emergency where the police were needed. When the police saw that the light was turned on, they would call the operator to see what the emergency was. The Chime Clock. In January of 1916, the Franklin National Bank installed a chime clock on the front of the first Ray block on Main Street. The tune that the clock chimed was the same one that is heard at Westminster Abbey in London, England. In November of 1922, a large sign over the entrance to the Franklin National Bank was blown off the building by a strong wind and it struck the chime clock. The glass that protects the dial was broken and one of the dials was damaged. Two months later, 
Both dials were replaced with more ornamental ones. Today, this clock is mounted on a pedestal in front of Dean Bank, which replaced the Ray Block in the 1980s. The Abbott Garage In December of 1915, construction began on a new building on Cottage Street, which was made of reinforced concrete that would become known as the Abbott Garage, the entire front and parts of the side being of plate glass show windows. The entrance was on the south side, 35 feet from the street, thus causing the parking of autos in the side yard instead of on the street. The repair shop was in the rear of the building. In January of 1919, Donald B. Chapman and Harry J. Gebb took possession of the Abbott Garage and renamed the firm the Gebb Chapman Company. They made extensions and additions to the repair department and retained the present garage force. They continued to carry the same lines of cars as the Abbott Garage. These included Ford, Dodge, and Buick. They also added the Goodyear Tire Service. In April of 1919, Mr. Chapman and Mr. Gebb built a garage on the site of the Crossley House adjoining their new garage. In September, this garage was finished with every detail being taken care of to make it an ideal place to do business. In the late 1920s, Sherman Chevrolet would begin doing business in this location. The Attempted Bombing of the American Woolen Company At 8.45 p.m. on a Friday evening in March of 1919, the residents of McCarthy Street and Sugarbeet Street heard a large muffled sound coming from the back of Ray's Hill. When the police arrived, they discovered that a bomb had gone off and that there were four victims of the blast. Those four men were planning to set off a bomb in the American Woolen Mills building. The police theorized that the bomb went off prematurely. The O.F. Metcalf and Son Lumberyard. In June of 1919, the lumberyard of Otis F. Metcalf and Son on West Central Street was purchased by the Locke Brothers of Milford. This picture was taken from the 1888 drawing of Franklin. The new owners incorporated the lumberyard under the title of Franklin Lumber Company. The Davis Thayer Jr. Home In December of 1919, a fire alarm rang from Box 32 indicating that the Davis Thayer Jr. home on West Central Street was on fire. This house was located to the right of the Franklin House, which had previously been the Davis Thayer Sr. homestead. Upon arrival, the firefighters saw that the house was doomed as the interior was completely ablaze. The house was being held in trust by Mr. and Mrs. Adelbert D. Thayer for D. Thayer Gallison, a grandson of the original owner. The estate was valued at about $25,000, and the house was insured for $12,000. And this concludes our presentation. Thanks for watching.